We praise him, send blessings upon his noble messenger. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and send blessings upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's noble messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. I seek refuge with Allah from the accursed shaytan. In Surah Nahal, ayat number 98, it says, so when you recite the Quran, first seek refuge in Allah from Satan, the expelled from his mercy. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the opportunity to always begin everything with Allah's names. These beautiful names of Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi, adad khalqi, wa nafsihi, wa zinat arshihi, wa midada kalimati. Allah is free from imperfection, and I begin with his praise as many times as the number of his creatures in accordance with his good pleasure, equal to the weight of his throne and equal to the ink that may be used in recording the words of his praise. Praise be to Allah, we seek his help and his forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one having no partner, I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and messenger. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqadatam min lisani yafkahu qawli. O my Lord, expand for me my breast with assurance and ease for me my task and untie the knot from my tongue that they may understand my speech. Surah Taha, ayat number 25 to 28. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless everyone. May Allah ta'ala guide us and protect us all. May we always turn to Allah for all our needs, for forgiveness and everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to us always. These are the beautiful days of Ramadan. May Allah give us life to continue during this month and, and in the most beautiful way. And then inshallah, whatever we have learned in this month, may we apply it throughout our, our lives. We are Muslims, not just during Ramadan, but during the entire year and for all our lives, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah help us always to be the best Muslims that we can. And you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Namal, Surah number 27, ayat number 62, is he not best who responds to the desperate one when he calls upon him? So for whatever problem we have, whatever difficulty, we find ourselves in. We have the most powerful we weapon. And what is that weapon? Which wards off the pain that plagues us? It is the weapon of dua. We know with certainty that Allah is Al Mujib, the responsive. That's one of His Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's most beautiful names, the ever responding one, always responds. And so we see that if we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with utter need, and submission and surrender to Allah and realize that truly it is only he who can get us out of our state of trials and tribulations. Also this pandemic that we're going through COVID-19, may Allah take it away. 
So we need to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to say, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Mujib, you are the one that is always responds. Please take away these trials and tribulations from us. Please guide us towards good. And so we see there's a beautiful hadith Qudsi. Allah says, O oh my servants, I have forbidden oppression for myself and have made it forbidden amongst you. So do not oppress one another. O oh my servants, all of you are astray except those I have guided. So seek guidance of me and I shall guide you. O oh, my servants, all of you are hungry except for those I have fed. So seek food of me and I shall feed you. O oh, my servants, all of you are naked except for those I have clothed. So seek clothing of me and I shall clothe you. O oh, my servants, you sin by night and by day and I forgive all your sins. So seek forgiveness of me and I shall forgive you. O oh, my servants, you will not attain harming me so as to harm me and will not attain benefiting me so as to benefit me. O oh, my servants, were the first of you and the last of you, the human of you and the jinn of you, um, to be as pious as the most pious heart of any one man of you, that would not increase my kingdom in anything. O oh, my servants, O oh, my servants, were the first of you and the last of you, the human of you and the jinn of you, to be as wicked as the most wicked heart of any one man of you that would not decrease my kingdom in anything. O oh, my servants, were the first of you and the last of you, the human of you and the jinn of you, to rise up in one place and make request of me, and were and I and were I to decree um, whatever you need, and and would I not decrease what I have any more? that a needle decreases the sea if put in it. O oh, my servant, it is but your deeds that I reckon up for you and then recompass you for. So let him who finds good praise Allah and let him who finds other than that blame no one but himself. This is recorded in Sahih Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always help us to turn to Al-Mujib, inshallah. Ameen. Today we will begin Surah Sajda, the prostration. And it is the Surah number 32, 32nd chapter of the Quran. We are in Juz 21, verses 1 through 30. Inshallah, we will go through them now. May Allah guide us towards good and towards collecting the lessons from this beautiful Surah, Surah Sajda. Suraj Sajda, the prostration. And you can imagine that there will be a prostration in the surah also, inshallah. We will do um, Sajda at one of the ayats when we come to it. Surah number 32, it's a Makkan surah. Three rakus, sequence of revelation is that it is the 75th surah as it was revealed and it has 30 ayats, inshallah ta'ala. Surah Sajda, some of the topics that we're going to cover, we're going to see some of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran is one of them, heavens and earth, the creation of man. We're going to see topics on disbelievers, their, their doubts, their demand on, for miracles as they always did. And then we're going to see the characteristics of the believers, how they fall into prostration. May Allah make us of those. Proclaim purity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not become dumb. Pray at night. Make dua with fear and hope. Beautiful topics, alhamdulillah. Let's hear the tilawat of the five first ayats of Surah As Sajda. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alif la. كتاب لا ريب فيه من رب العالمين أم يقولون افتراه بل هو الحق من ربك لتنذر قوما ما 
آتاهم من نذير من قبلك لعلهم يهتدون الله الذي خلق السماوات والأرض وما بينهما في ستة أيام ثم استوى على العرش ما لكم من دونه من ولي ولا شفيع أفلا تتذكرون يدبر الأمر من السماء إلى الأرض ثم يعرج إليه في يوم كان مقداره كان مقداره ألف سنة مما تعدون ذلك عالم الغيب والشهادة العزيز الرحيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الحمد لله we just heard the tilawat of Kari al-Mashari first six ayats first six verses alhamdulillah a'uz billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim surah as-sajda in the name of allah the most gracious the most merciful alif lam mim these are the disjointed letters the huruf al muqattad only allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the meaning of we go to ayat number 2 the revelation of the book there is no doubt about it from the lord of the worlds subhanallah this is not a, hum, a human written book this is not from any angel or any prophet this is uh, the revelation of the book there is no doubt about it from the lord of the worlds from the lord of everything ayat number 3 or do they say he invented it nay it is the truth from your lord that you may warn a people to whom no warner has come before you so that they may be guided so here we have uh, we are being told that the people of makka uh, did not have a prophet there ever and so um, here is a message from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they can be guided alhamdulillah ayat number 4 allah is the one who created the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them in six periods then he established himself on the throne you have no you have not besides him any protector or intercessor then will you not take heed he regulates the affair from the heaven to the earth then it will ascend to him in a day the measure of which is a thousand years of what you count so this time period that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks talks about is only known to allah this is a mutashabihat ayat the true meaning only allah knows this is allah's greatness allah's grandeur only allah knows how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala operates it's all in his wisdom and all in his knowledge ayat number 6 that is the knower of the hidden and the witnessed and almighty the most merciful allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's beautiful names almighty and all merciful al aziz and ar rahim ayat number 7 the one who made everything he created good and he began the creation of man from clay so alhamdulillah hazrat adam alayhi salam we know was made of clay and then he made his progeny from an extract of liquid despised so after Adam al Islam was made. Then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala put into this um, a marvel into the humanity and how uh, we produce, uh, how we reproduce, and um, how we go forward with life. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. So we see that here we said the first man on earth, the father of mankind, whom Allah made of clay. Then He made Adam's wife Eve from the left rib of Uh, Adam, as the hadith tells us, uh, then uh, we see that is um, from now we are made from a drop of semen. The meaning of the verse is that we created Adam and Eve, the prototypes, and decreed that their offspring, male and females, would marry and multiply. So we 
marry and we multiply. And so we go forward and we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayat number nine, and he fashioned him and breathed into him his spirit and made for you hearing and sight and feelings, little things you give. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his own hands fashioned us and breathed into us his spirit, this root that we have, alhamdulillah. He shaped us beautifully, proportioned us, molded us. He gave us consciousness and judgment and the ability to make decisions. He made us Ashraf al makhlukat Allah gave all these qualities to us. We should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, we should use the faculties that he's given us, the senses that he's given us in, in to recognize him, number one, to recognize him, number one, to thank him, and number one, to use these faculties, these senses, and these limbs that he has given us in his cause, and also within the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he's made. So such a beautiful creation humanity is. May we thank Allah, and may we be guided towards using all that he has given us in his direction, in the proper direction. Idina Sirat al Mustaqim. Ayat number 10. And they say, when we are lost in the earth, will we certainly be in a new creation? Nay, they are disbelievers in the meeting of their Lord. Ayat number 11. Say, the angel of death who has been put in charge of you will take your soul then to your Lord, you will be returned. He made us, he gave us a chance to live in this world. We are being tested every second of the day. And then eventually we'll go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angel of death who has been put in charge of you will take your soul then to your Lord, you will be returned. Ayat number 12, and if you could see when the criminals will hang their heads in shame before their Lord saying, our Lord, we have, seen and we have heard so return us we will do righteous deeds indeed we are now certain so then the disbelievers when they are now are facing these uh, angels of punishment they will say please take us back to the world now we know the truth and we will be righteous and then uh, we see in ayat number 13 and if we had willed surely we would have given every soul its guidance but the word from me will come true I will fill hell with jinn and men altogether. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this life is a test. If I gave you the ability to recognize me, even with my veil, then there wouldn't be any test. I am behind the veil. You have to recognize me through my signs. You are being tested. And I, everybody chooses what is right and what is wrong and everybody knows and everybody's been given guidance so if we choose not to walk on the path of guidance then we are the losers and if, so we see ayat number 13 again and if we had willed surely we would have given every soul its guidance but the word from me will come true and i will fill hell with jinn and men altogether so if people choose not to walk on the right path naturally their abode will be hell and then we see in ayah number 14, so taste the punishment because you forgot the meeting of the day of yours. Indeed, we have forgotten you. So taste the punishment of eternity for what you used to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you forgot me in this world. Now I will not pay attention you, to you now. So uh, Allah will say to the disbelievers on the day of judgment, we have forgotten you just as you forgot us in your worldly life. It is a way to reprove because Allah does not forget anything. Allah does not forget anything, but he will say that I don't want to pay attention to you anymore because you didn't pay attention to my rules and regulations, my boundaries. You didn't worship me in the world. So taste the punishment because you forgot the meeting of this day of yours. Indeed, we have forgotten you. So taste the punishment of eternity for what you used to do. Ayat number 15, only those believe in our verses who, when they are reminded, of them fall down in prostration and glorify the praises of their Lord and they are not arrogant. Who are those that prostrate, prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who are those that go into sajda? Allah says, these are the qualities of, of, of people who Allah loves. They surrender and they only those believe in our verses who when they're reminded fall down in prostration. They're scared to displease Allah. They glorify Allah, they praise Allah, and they are humble, down-to-earth people. They are not arrogant. 
Ayat number 16, their sides forsake their beds. These are the same people. Who are these people who prostrate? Their sides forsake their beds at night. They call their Lord in fear and hope and they spend out of what we have provided them. So these are special people who get up at the Hajjah time, who, who give from what Allah has given. They give sadqa, they give zakat, they give khairat. Alhamdulillah, these are the people. May Allah make us of those. Alhamdulillah. And we have a beautiful hadith uh, narrated by Abu Huraira. He said that Allah's messenger said, Our Lord, the blessed, the superior, comes down every night to the nearest heaven to us during the last third of the night and says, Is there anyone who invokes me? So this is the beautiful time of Tahajjud, right before Fajr. Uh, so he says, is there anyone who invokes me, demands anything from me so that I may respond to his innovation, his invocation, I'm sorry, his invocation, his supplication, his dua? Is there anyone who asks me so that I may grant him his request? Is there anyone who seeks my forgiveness so that I may forgive him? This is recorded in Sahih Bukhari 1145. And so we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually reaching out to us at that time. And he's saying, is there anyone who wants anything? I'm here to respond. I'm here to give. May Allah wake us up at that time. May we reach out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time, inshallah ta'ala. That is a very precious time of a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see... In number 16, their sides forsake their beds at night. They call their Lord in fear and hope, and they spend out of what we have provided them. Ayat number 17. And no soul knows what is hidden for them of comfort for eyes as a reward for what they used to do. So alhamdulillah, the, the, this place, this beautiful place of heaven is... Nobody knows the beauty of Jannah. Nobody knows. Nobody can imagine. And in Hadith Qudsi explains it further. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, For my pious slaves, I have prepared what no eye has seen, nor any ear has heard, nor any human ever imagined. So we can't even imagine how beautiful uh, heaven is going to be. This is recorded in Sahih Bukhari, Hadith number 4779. So uh, we see this, that Ayat number 17, and no soul knows what is hidden for them of comfort for the eyes as a reward for what they used to do. Ayat number 18, then is one who is a believer like him, who is a defiant, defiantly disobedient, they are not equal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, how can a believer be equal to a disbeliever? A moment recognizes the truth and sacrifices his desire for Allah, for akhirah. This is absolutely different than what a disobe disobedient um, person does, what a disbeliever does. He doesn't sacrifice any of his comforts. He doesn't look forward to the akhira. He doesn't even believe in the akhira so many times. So ayat number 19, as for those who believe and do righteous deeds, for them are gardens of refuge as hospitality for what they used to do. SubhanAllah, hospitality from Allah. Can, that, can there be anything better than that? May Allah forgive us. May Allah guide us. May Allah protect us. May Allah take us there with his mercy. Ayat number 20. But as for those who are defiantly disobedient, here's a contrast. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is contrasting between believers and disbelievers. As for those who are defiantly disobedient, their refuge is fire. Every time they wish to come out from it, they will be returned in it. And it will be said to them, taste the punishment of the fire, which you used to deny. And surely we will let them taste the lighter punishment, disasters and calamities of the world before the greater punishment so that they may return. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings trials and tribulations into the lives of everyone. And when he brings it into the lives of the disbelievers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shaking them up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is waking them up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them a chance to realize the power of Allah and to turn to Allah. So that he realizes how helpless he is, how powerless he is, and, you know, and turns to Allah before something even greater can happens. So may we all learn lessons from what we go through. And there's so much to learn from this health crisis that this globe is facing, this pandemic that we are facing, this coronavirus, COVID-19 that we are facing. 
in an instant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closed the entire world. In an instant, travel stopped. In an instant, shops closed. Trade stopped. Businesses closed. Schools and colleges and universities closed. This is the power of Allah through a little virus that we cannot even see with our naked eye. This is the power of Allah. May we wake up to be better people, inshallah. May, may we leave our wrongs. Ameen. Ayat number 22. And who is more unjust than he who is reminded of the verses of his Lord than he turns away from them? Indeed, we will take retribution from the criminals. The greatest loser is the one who turns away from the verses of Allah. These beautiful ayats that we are reading, these lessons, this guidance that Allah has given, ayat number 23. And certainly we gave Musa the scripture, so do not be in doubt about receiving it. And we made the Torah a guide for the children of Israel. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the people of Makkah, what is so objectionable that you can't understand this is, this is the word of Allah? You know of the history uh, and you know that they were prophets before. You know that they were given instructions. And here is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being given instructions. At number 24. And we made from them leaders guiding by our command when they were patient and they were certain of our verses. Indeed, your Lord will judge between them on the day of resurrection concerning that over which they used to defer. At number 26. Is it not a guidance for them? How many generations we have destroyed before them in whose dwelling they walk about? Indeed, in that are signs. Then do they not hear? At number 27, have they not seen that we drive rain to barren land? Then we bring forth thereby crops from which their cattle um, and they themselves eat. Then do they not see? SubhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has barren land and how rain uh, brings life uh, with the permission of Allah to this barren land and crops go, grow and vegetation grows and alhamdulillah, Allah shows us all these things. So water here, have they not seen that we revive, we drive rain to the barren land and we bring forth thereby crops from which their cattle and they themselves eat then do they not see? And here we see that water refers to all types of water, including that of rainfall, streams, and rivers. So it, in the meaning of the verse is that Allah causes water to reach barren lands and makes crops grow to feed humans and cattle. Ayat number 28, and they say, when will this decision be if you are truthful? So they always used to say, when uh, is... When, when are you going to be, bring the punishment? When are you going to tell us that, um, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is punishing us and so forth. And so we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also uh, in ayat number 28 says here that say on the day of the decision, let, let me read 28 again. And they say, when will this decision be if they are truthful? So the pagans used to say, when are you going to bring the doom? And then in, we see in 29, say on the day of decision, the belief of those who disbelieve will not benefit them, nor will they be granted respite. So turn away from them and wait. Indeed, they too are waiting. So we see that, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says over here in ayat number 29, the day of decision refers to the day of judgment, not the day of the conquest of Makkah when about 2,000 pagans who had tortured and persecuted the believers were forgiven under the general amnesty granted by Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Most of them escaped. Most of them had escaped all those days and they tortured the Muslims, but now most of them accepted Islam. This is uh, stated in Ibn Kathir. On the day of judgment, the disbelievers will neither be reprieved nor forgiven, even if they repent and believe. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so turn away from them and wait. Indeed, they too are waiting. So withdraw from the pagans, overlook their hostility, and continue your missionary work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guiding Rasul Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
follow that which is inspired to you from your Lord. There is no God save him and turn away from the idolaters. And so Allah says that when he says, wait till Allah gives you victory, which he has promised you, surely he will fulfill his promise. So the pagans always hoped for the messenger of Allah mission to fail sooner or later, but their hope never materialized because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave his messenger وسلم, victory over his opponents. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And I wanted to let you know that uh, Rasul Kareem وسلم, used to read this surah. Uh, he used to recite a sajda and also al-insan on Fridays in the Fajr prayer. This is recorded in Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 891 and Sahih Muslim 879. Moreover, according to an authentic narration, he also used to recite this surah and surah al-mulk at night before he went to bed, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This is in Jamia Tirmizi, um, hadith number 892 and Muslim Ahmad, hadith number 340. A beautiful surah talking about believers and disbelievers, talking about the creation, talking about the fact that um, the qualities of the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, they do prostration, they give sadqa, they wake up at the hajjud, and so on. Alhamdulillah, say they sacrifice their desire for the desire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, and we will now go on to the next surah, inshallah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, we will begin Surah Al-Ahzab, the confederates, the groups. And this is the 33rd chapter of the Quran. It begins in Juz 21, verses 1 to 28 are in this Juz, and then Juz 22, verses 29 to 73, inshallah ta'ala. Surah Al-Ahzab, the clans, the confederates, the groups. Surah 33, it's a Madni Surah. And it has nine rukus, it has 73 ayats, and in sequence of revelation, it's the 90th surah to be revealed out of 114. Some of the topics being covered in Surah Al Azab are so the status of the Prophet وسلم, and his obedience to Allah, and the disbelievers and hypocrites, and their practices of ignorance. And also the status of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how he is close to you, he loves his ummah, his wives are our mothers, and favors of Allah and Jalla Jalaluhu on Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the battle of Ahzab, good news of victory, conquest of Banu Quraza, wives of the Prophet are role models for us, instructions to the wives of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also we will see how Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam obeys Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, obedience of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and advice to the believers on following this in the footsteps of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Take the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's decision and verdict. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not a father to any man. He is a witness. He is a giver of glad, glad tidings. He's a warner. He's a caller to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the lamp, illuminating lamp. Special rules to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and marriage. Etiquettes shown to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sending blessings to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Consequence of hurting or harming Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Example of the people of Musa alayhi wa sallam. Whoever obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they will get success. The trust of the uh, the trust of Sharia and its importance are also part of this beautiful surah, inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, inshallah, we will hear the tilawat, the first five verses, the first five ayat of Surah Al Ahzab. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها النبي اتق الله ولا تطع الكافرين والمنافقين إن 
تلاوت بائی کاری المشاری الحمد للہ سورہ الحزاب اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم in the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful O Prophet fear Allah and do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites indeed Allah is all nor all wise so we are told that Sayyidina Ibn Abbas رضی اللہ تعالیٰ عنہ It was after Hijrah that, that uh, Walid ibn Mughaira and Sahiban ibn Rabia from among the Kuffar of Makkah came to Medina. They made an offer before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that they would let him have half of the entire wealth of the Quraysh of Makkah if they were to withdraw his claim and if he was to withdraw his claim to prophethood. And the hypocrites and the Jews of Medina gave him a threat that they would kill him if he did not withdraw from this claim and this call. Thereupon, these verses were revealed. This is recorded in Ru al Ma'ani. So, here was pressure being mounted, or mounted on Rasul Karim وسلم, to withdraw his prophethood. And so, we see that Allah, what, is the, what are the directions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in ayat number one, O Prophet, fear Allah and do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Indeed, Allah is all knower, all wise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's beautiful names, Al-Alim and Al-Hakim. And ayat number two, and follow what I inspired to you from your Lord. Indeed, Allah is all aware of what you do. And put your trust in Allah, and Allah is sufficient as a disposer of affairs. Allah has not made for any man two hearts in his interior body, and he has not made your wives, whom you declare unlawful by saying, you are to me like the back of my mother as your mothers, and he has not made your adopted sons your real sons. That is your, your saying by your mouths, but Allah says the truth, and he guides to the right way. So there are many different um, things being mentioned in ayat number four. And the first one is that Allah has not made two hearts in any man's body. That means that no one can be a disbeliever and a believer at the same time. That means that no one, no heart can hold, hold two ideologies. No two ideologies can prevail together in one person's heart. And so a hypocrite used to say that he had two hearts one leaning to the Muslims and the other to the disbelievers. This is recorded in Musnad Ahmad, hadith number 268. And the second thing that is mentioned in this ayat is that, um, and, and do not call someone, uh, you know, and he has not made your wives whom you declare unlawful by saying you are like the back of my mother. So there was a prevalent um, tradition at that time 
people, some of them used to follow, which was that if you're angry with your wife, if you don't want any relations with your wife anymore, you, you call, it was called zihar. And it was like, you would say that like, you are now like the back of my mother, you are like my mother. So, and this is something that Islam came to wipe away. Of course, your mother, your biological mother is only one. No one else can become your mother, especially not your wife. And so here you are not, you are to me like the back of my mother as, as your mother and he has not made your adopted sons your real sons and the third thing that is mentioned here is that um, adopted sons cannot be your biological sons they cannot get inheritance like your biological children yes islam encourages adoption islam wants us to take care of others islam wants us to take care of orphans we can adopt children we can adopt boys and we can adopt girls, but we cannot give them our names. The father can God give them, give their, give the children the, his name. His, the children's name will always be their original biological father's name if it is known. If not, then they will be called by their name only, but will not be connected, uh, by you know, to the um, father's name who is who has adopted them because this has to do because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supreme he doesn't want any injustice to occur between the real biological children and the adopted ones alhamdulillah so here we see that um uh then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also uh Rasul Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa is all had also adopted that bin Harissa and called him his own son. And we will see further on how Allah guides him towards something that he needs to do. Okay, so we were here, we'll read um, ayat number four again. And Allah has not made for any man two hearts in his interior body. And he has not made your wives from whom you declare unlawful by saying you are to me like the back of my mother as your mother's and he has not made your adopted sons your real sons that is your saying by your mouth but Allah says the truth and he guides to the right way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the English translation in ayat number five is call them by the names of their fathers it is more just in the sight of Allah but if you do not know their fathers then they are your brothers in religion and your friends but there is no blame upon you if you make a mistake therein. What counts is that your heart's intent and Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. So, so in this ayat, we see this command, abolish the age old custom of considering adopted sons just like real sons a custom which was in force in the pre-islamic age of ignorance and remained in practice even in the early days of islam the companions narrated that they used to refer to zad bin haritha whom the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had set free and adopted as his son zad bin muhammad until this verse came that that proclaim their real parentage was revealed this is in sahih bukhari 4782 and then we see that it is a gross sin to make false claims to parentage hadith says whoever attributes himself to someone other than his own father commits the sin of kufr this is sahih bukhari Hadith number 3508. And then we see in ayat number six, the prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves and his wives are their mothers and possessors of relationship are closer to one another in decree to Allah than the believers and the immigrants except that you do kindness to your friends that is written in the book so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us how much rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam is connected with his ummah how close he is the prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves and um the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was very kind to his ummah 
That is why Allah said that he had greater right over the believers than they had over themselves, his love exceeding their love of themselves. Therefore, the believers should not hesitate to sacrifice all their wealth in the way of Allah if he requests no matter how much they need it themselves. In short, this command supersedes all other commands until one surrenders oneself entirely to him. One cannot be a true believer. A hadith says, None of you can be a believer until I am dearer to him than his father, his son, and all mankind together. This is Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam should be dearer to us than our fathers, our sons, and all mankind together. Sahih Bukhari, um, number 15. So obedience to the messenger of Allah is as important as obedience to Allah. O oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger and render not your actions in vain. Surah number 47, ayat number 33. So, um, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the Prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the wives of Rasul Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa are our mothers. And alhamdulillah, then we go on to ayat number seven. And when we took from prophets their covenant and from you and from Nu and Ibrahim and Musa and Isa, son of Maryam. And we took from them a strong covenant. This covenant was uh, that all prophets should support each other, complement each other and establish the deen and not be divided. And then we see in ayat number eight that he may ask the truthful about their truth and he has prepared for the disbelievers a painful punishment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask, did you convey my message? And um, alhamdulillah, we see that, and that he may ask the truthful about their truth and he has prepared for the disbelievers a painful punishment. Act number nine, O oh, you who you believe, Remember the favor of Allah upon you when the host came to you and we sent upon them wind and hosts that you could not see. And Allah is all seer of what you do. So here uh, the battle of Azab is being mentioned, which was took place in the fifth year of Hijra. And Azab means combined forces. So we will see in this verse, there are some details of the battle of Confederates, the battle of Azab, which took pay, place in the fifth Hijri. The battle takes its name from the word Ahzab, which the plural of Hizb, meaning clan or party. In this battle, several pagan tribes joined together to invade Medina, the center and focal point of the Muslims. It is also called the Battle of Trench because the Muslims dug, up, dug out a trench about, uh, around Medina to prevent the invaders from entering Medina. The background story of the battle is as follows. The Jewish tribe of Banu Nadir, whom the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had banished because of their persistent treachery and betrayal, had gone over to Khabar and settled there. While there, they instigated that Makkan pagan, they instigated the Makkan pagans to invade Medina. Then they also encouraged the Ghaftan tribe of Najd to join the battle and assured them of help. To, to the south of Medina, there was another Jewish tribe, Banu Kuraza, who, though they had been until then allies of the Muslim, broke the alliance with the Muslim and joined ranks with the invaders. That was when Huyay bin Akhtab, a chieftain of Banu Nadir, persuaded them to break away and join hands with them against the Muslims. Thus, the Muslims were almost encircled by the invading foes. The pagans were led by Abu Sufyan, who had not yet embraced Islam. He camped around Uhud and laid siege to Medina. The pagan forces numbered 10,000, while the Muslim forces were no more than 3,000. Anyhow, before the enemy forces reached Medina, the Muslims had already dug out a trench around Medina, as proposed by Salman al-Farsi. The trench kept the pagans away giving them no access to enter Medina. But the siege was very painful for the Muslims who remained in the state of acute fear and anxiety. The siege continued for as long as a month, but ultimately Allah helped the Muslims. 
these verses refer to that painful plight of the Muslims and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rescued them from their misery. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped them by hosts, armies, and an allusion to the pagan forces which came together to invade Medina. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped with winds and hosts of angels. We will see that later. The wind refers to the strong wind which blew so violently that it uprooted the enemy camps, overturned their cooking pots, and even forced the animals to break loose. Totally shaken, the pagans took to their heels. Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was referring to this very wind when he said, I was helped with the eastern wind while the tribe of Ad were destroyed by the, by the southern wind. This is recorded in Sahih Bukhari Hadith number 3205 and Sahih Muslim Hadith number 900. Hosts, you did not see an allusion to the angels who came to help um, the Muslims. They created awe in the hearts of the disbelievers, forcing them to lift the siege and flee in terror. So Allah's help came, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always helps the believers and uh, how he helped with the violent winds, how he helped with his angels and how the, this battle uh, didn't take place, but the fear lasted for almost a month. Narrated Abdullah bin Abi Ufa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he invoked evil upon the Azab, the confederate, saying, O oh Allah, the revealer of the holy book, example, the Quran, and the quick taker of the accounts, please defeat the Azab, the confederates, O oh Allah, defeat them and shake them. This is recorded in Sahih Bukhari. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's dua to uh, gain victory. And then we see another hadith. Narrated by uh, Abdullah Razila Ta'ala Anhu, whenever Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam returned from a ghazba or Hajj or Umrah, he used to start saying Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar thrice, and then he would say La ilaha illallah, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah alone who has no partners, to him belongs the kingdom, all praises are for him, and he is able to do all things. We were returning with repentance to Allah, worship, worshiping him, prostrating him and praising our Lord. Allah has fulfilled his promise, made his slave victorious, and he, he alone defeated the Ahzab, the Confederates, recorded in Sahih Bukhari, Hadith number 4116. This just goes to show how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala listened to Rasul Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how much help came during this battle of confederates, the battle of Azab, the battle also called the battle of Khandak, battle of trench. We go on further, inshallah. We see that um, ayat number, number 10. When they came upon you from above you and from below you, and when the eyes grew wild and the hearts reached the throats and you assumed that about Allah various assumptions, because the enemy were 10,000 and the Muslim were just 3,000. There, the believers were tried and shaken with a severe shaking. And when the hypocrites and those in whose hearts was a disease said, Allah and his messenger promised us nothing but delusion. And when a party of them said, O oh, people of Yathrib, there is no stand possible for you to so return. And a group of them asked permission from the Prophet saying, indeed, our houses are exposed to the enemy, exposed to the enemy while they were not exposed and they did not wish but to flee. So a, a lot of weak, my, weak hearted, weak minded people wanted to retreat. Ayat number 14. And if the enemy had entered upon them from all sides and they had been asked to commit treachery, they would have done it and they would have not hesitated over it except a little so you know this is these are the hypocrites who are being mentioned who would have who would always turn and uh, and leave the muslims at time of need at number 15 and indeed they had promised allah before not to turn their backs and the promise to allah will be questioned say 
Fleeing will never benefit you if you flee from death or killing. And then you will not be allowed to enjoy except a little. Say, who is it that can protect you from Allah if he intends for you any harm or intends for you mercy? And they will not find for themselves besides Allah any protector or helper. Only protection is Allah's. Ayat number 18, verily Allah knows those who hinder among you and those who say to their brothers, come to us, and they do not come to battle except a few. Ayat number 19, being miserly, unwilling to offer any help towards you, but when fear comes, you see them looking at you, their eyes revolving like one who faints from death. But when fear departs, they smite you with sharp tongues, miserly towards doing any good. Those have not believed. So Allah made their deeds worthless. And that is easy for Allah. They think that the Confederates have not withdrawn. And if the Confederates should come again, they would wish they were living in the desert among the Bedouins asking about your news. And if they were among you, they would not fight except a little. So Alhamdulillah, with Allah's help, the strong winds and the angels and the trench that was dig, dug, the, the Confederates did not attack. And although the invading clans had left for good, these cowardly hypocrites, pale from fear, continue to believe that they are still in, in their camps, lying in wait to attack them. Should the disbelievers come back again to fight, these hypocrites would prefer to be outside Medina in the desert with Bedouins inquiring now and then about whether the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was dead or alive or whether the army of the disbelievers won or lost the battle. They only make an occasional show of participating in the battle out of fear of incurring disgrace or motivated by tribalism. This is a stern warning to those who lag behind in event of jihad. And so we see that how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps his beautiful believers who fight in his cause. Ayat number 21, and certainly in the messenger of Allah, you have an excellent example for anyone whose hope is in Allah and the last day and remembers Allah much. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that we have a beautiful example, an excellent example of Allah's uh, messenger, Rasul Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is our role model. And if we want salvation, we need to follow him. Certainly in the messenger of Allah, you have an excellent example for anyone whose hope is in Allah and the last day and remembers Allah much. So Alhamdulillah, uh, we need to learn about Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We need to read his seerah. We need to read the uh, hadith that are available. We need to know the sunnah ways of operating our lives. And so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, you have an excellent example for anyone whose hope is in Allah. And if we want Allah's love, we need to follow Rasul Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if we want hope in the last day, we have and we have to remember Allah and we have to follow in the steps of Rasul Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uswatun Hasana, excellent example. Alhamdulillah. Ayat number 22. And when the believers saw the Confederates, they said, this is what Allah and his messenger promised us and Allah and his messenger spoke the truth. And it only increased them in faith and submission. So when they saw the danger, they knew that this was a test and a trial and they, their iman increased. This is just the opposite of what happens to the hypocrites. Ayat number 23, among the believers are men true to what they promised Allah. And among them is he who has fulfilled his vow. And among them is he who waits. And, and they did not alter the terms of their commitment by any alteration. So this verse is in praise of some of the companions who set unparalleled examples of valor and sacrifice in the battle, as well as those companions who could not take part in the battle of Badr, but pledged to fight in any battle if it took place in future. An excellent example of that was Nadir bin Anas, who died fighting in the Battle of Ohud. He suffered 80 wounds on his body from cuts by swords and lances and arrows. The wounds disfigured his body beyond recognition. 
His sister was only able to recognize his, his body through his fingertips. This is recorded in Musnad Ahmad 193. So uh, the vow that is being mentioned is a pledge vow of death. The meaning is that some of them have fulfilled their vow by dying in battle. And so there are also others who are awaiting a chance to fulfill their vow of death in Allah's cause, and they have not changed in the least bit. And so we see, we go on to the next ayat, next verse here. Ayat number 24, that Allah may reward the truthful for their truth and punish the hypocrites if he wills or turn in mercy to them. Indeed, Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. And Allah turned back to those who disbelieved in their rage. They did not obtain any good. And sufficient is Allah for the believers in battle. And Allah is strong, almighty, all strong, almighty. Allah's beautiful names, Al-Qawi, Al-Aziz. So this was the largest army in Arabia ever put together. No battle like this took place before. And, um, you know, and so we see that when Allah's help comes, it doesn't matter how big the army is. And then we see in ayat number 26, and he brought down those who supported them among the people of the scripture from their fortresses and cast terror into hearts, a group you killed and a group you took captive. 27, and he caused you to inherit their land and their houses and their properties and a land which you had not trodden, set your foot before. And Allah on everything is all powerful. The reference is to the Jewish tribe of Banu Quraza who betrayed the Muslims in battle of confederates and went over to the side of the pagans and other Jews. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had just come back from the Battle of Clans, the Battle of uh, Confederates, and finished taking his bath when Jibreel Alayhi Wasallam came and said to him, you laid down your arms, you laid down arms, but we the angels have not. Let us go to Banu Quraza and deal with them. Allah has sent me to you for that purpose. So he made an announcement to the Muslims to set out for another bout, even instructing them to perform the Asr prayer near the settlements a few miles away from Medina. As the Muslims laid siege uh, to their strongholds, they shut themselves in. The siege continued for about 25 days. Ultimately, they agreed to accept Saad bin Muad an arbitrator to decide their case. Saad gave his decision that their men of fighting age be put to death, their women and children be made captive and their property be divided among the Muslims. On hearing it, Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remarked, that is the judgment of Allah from up in the heaven. The, de the decision was executed, they were slain and Medina was relieved of traitors. Uh, this is recorded in Sahih Bukhari Hadith number 4121. And the land not trodden here, some commentators say that it refers to the land of Khaybar, which the Muslims conquered in the 6th Hijri after the Treaty of Hudabiyah, while others say that it refers to Mecca. Still, others say that it refers to the land of Persia and Rome. Some hold that it refers to all the lands which the Muslims will conquer till the day of resurrection, recorded in Fatal Qadir. Ayat number 28. O Prophet, say to your wives, if you desire the life of this world, its adornment, then come. I will provide for you and release you with good release. So now because the um, Muslims had uh, conquered many places and they had a lot of booty and they distributed the things and um, they were in a better state of affairs. The economic standards had improved. And many, um, so the wives also asked Rasul Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if their, uh, their houses and their economic standards can improve also. But uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always liked to live a simple living 
Wooten style. He was a very simple man. He liked simplicity. So this was said oh, um, that uh, this ayat, O Prophet, say to your wives, if you desire the life of this world and its adornment, then come. I will provide for you a release um, and release you with good release. But if you desire Allah and his messenger and the home of the hereafter, then indeed Allah has prepared for the good doers among you a great reward. So all the mothers, all the wives of Rasul Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose to be with Rasul Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and chose Darul Akhira, chose the hereafter over the over improving the standards of the house. So Alhamdulillah, uh, you know, when Hazrat Umar um, Razila Ta'ala Anhu used to look at Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam style of living and once uh, he would uh, once he when he saw Rasul Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lying on uh, a bed that was not soft it was hard he said you know the kings live in such a magnificent way and you live this way so Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had told him that I want the Akhira I don't want anything of this world and this is how Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to live his life Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ad again addressing the wives of the Prophet. O wives of the Prophet, whoever of you commits a clear immorality, for her the punishment will be doubled, and that is easy for Allah. And whoever of you is obedient to Allah and his messenger and does righteousness, we will give her reward twice, and we have prepared for her a noble provision. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's wives have been specially warned because any improper conduct on their part would hurt the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it is known that hurting him is, a tant is tantamount to disbelief. Moreover, the wives of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were models of virtue and morality. Minor slips of men of God are considered major mistakes. Hence, a minor mistake or error on the part of Prophet's wives Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would require a double of punishment and the reward for the good work will be doubled for them just as the punishment for vice will be doubled for them. And so we see, and whoever of you is obedient to Allah and his messenger and does righteousness, we will give her reward twice and we have prepared for her a noble provision. O wives of the Prophet, you are not like anyone among women. If you fear Allah, then do not be soft in speech, lest he in whose heart is a disease should be moved with desire, but say an appropriate word. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving direct instructions to the wives of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And stay in your houses and do not display yourself as was the display of the former times of ignorance and establish the prayer and give zakah and obey Allah and his messenger. Allah only wishes to remove from you the impurity, O people of, of the house, and to purify you with thorough purification. These are the mothers of the believers, our role models. And remember what is recited in your houses from the verses of Allah and the wisdom. Indeed, Allah is subtle, all aware. Ayat number 35. Indeed, the Muslim men and the Muslim women, the believing men and the believing women, the obedient men and the obedient women, the truthful men and the truthful women, the patient men and the patient women, the humble men and the humble women, the men who give charity and the women who give charity, the men who fast and the women who fast, the men who and women who guard their chastity, the men and women who remember Allah much. Allah has prepared for them forgiveness and great reward. A beautiful way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing equality in the genders. And all decisions from Allah are for both. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, always considers the both, both genders spiritually absolutely equal. Physically, we are different. But uh, as human beings, we have the same emotions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses both the women and the men. And then we go in on to 36 ayat of Surah Ahzab. English translation is, and it is not for the believing man 
or women, when Allah and his messenger has decided a matter that they should have any choice about the affair and whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger, certainly he has strayed into clear error. So ayat number 36, yes, uh, this verse was revealed concerning Zainab's marriage to Zaid bin Harissa. Zaid was an Arab, but someone had seized him while he was still a child and sold him as a slave. Later, Khatija anha, gave him as a gift to Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who set him free, adopted him as his son. But, but when he sent a, a message to Zainab, his paternal cousin, proposing to her to marry Zaid, she and her brother were hesitant because Zaid was a freed slave, which, while they belonged to a very respectable family. Thereupon, this verse was revealed. It is said in no unclear terms that it was not permissible for the believers to have a say in a matter already decided by Allah and his messenger. Their duty is just to submit to Allah's will and his prophets without demur. Therefore, after the revelation of this verse, Zainab and her kinsmen had no choice except to carry out what Allah had decreed and, proposed the mar and, and the proposed marriage took place. Let's read ayat number 37. And when you said to the one whom Allah bestowed favor and you too bestowed favor, keep your wife to yourself and fear Allah, but you concealed within yourself that which Allah had, was to disclose and you fear the people while Allah has more right that you should fear him. So when Zad fulfilled necessary formalities of divorce with her, he married her. We married her to you so that there may be no discomfort on the, on the believers concerning the wives of their adopted sons when they have fulfilled the necessary formalities of divorce with them and the command of Allah must be accomplished. So Zaid bin Harissa and Zainab, uh, they, they had difference in temperaments and this created marital difficulties and the two did not get along well. Zaid would often inform Messenger of Allah of it and express his desire to divorce her, but Messenger of Allah would counsel him not to do so and urged him to carry on anyhow. However, he had come to know from Allah that they would ultimately separate. Uh, Rasul Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was told by Allah that they would ultimately separate and that she would be married to him. The purpose being to do away with the age old custom of the age of ignorance, which considered an adopted son as good as a real son and to establish by practice that it is permissible to marry the divorcee of an adopted son. That is what the verse was revealed for. Allah's favor to Zaid was that he guided him to the faith of Islam and rescued him from slavery. While, messenger, while the messenger of Allah's favor to him was that he brought him up and instructed him in religion, set him free, adopted him as a son, and then got him married to the daughter of his paternal aunt, Umama bint Abd Muttalib. The thing um, that he hid in himself was his future marriage to Zainab, which he had come to know of beforehand by revelation, that he feared was the public, was the public reaction to such marriage. Um, he feared that there would be a public reaction to such a marriage, that it would become the talk of the town that he married his daughter-in-law. Obviously, when Allah had already decreed to put an end to this pagan custom through him, there was no need for him to fear. His fear was quite natural, but nevertheless, Allah cautioned him in this respect. The thing Allah wanted to bring to light was, that was the coming marriage, that is, when it would take place, everybody would come to know. So when he divorced Zainab, um, she completed the waiting period. And then um, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's marriage took place by Allah's decree. So it was Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's decree that uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would get married to Zainab and his marriage took place in heaven. This was done by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So there was no need to perform the marriage formalities on the earth. 
Ayat number 38, there can be no discomfort upon the Prophet concerning that which Allah has imposed on him, that is, Allah's way concerning those who passed away before, and the command of Allah is a decree destined. Those who convey the messages of, messages of Allah and fear him and do not fear anyone except Allah, and sufficient is Allah as a reckoner. Wakafa billahi hathiba. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is not the father of any one of you, your men, but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets, and Allah is all knower of everything. So Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the ultimate role model, a simple person, and he is the seal of the prophets. That means he's the last of the prophets. There will be no prophet after Rasul Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he's not the father of any men. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did have sons. So look at the cho chosen words here. He was the father of boys, but he's never been the father of men. This is amazing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's choice of words. And so we see that this, so the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had three sons, we, we were mentioning earlier. He had sons, Qasim, Tahir, and Tayyib from his wife Khatija radiallahu anha and one Ibrahim from Maria the Copt but all of them died in infancy this is recorded in Ibn Kathir then late, further on um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayat number 40 that uh, we were just saying that he's the seal of the prophets is the end of prophethood we'll talk a little bit more about that the seal is a final act hence khatam uh, hence, it means the finality of prophethood. That is, prophethood ends with him. They cannot and will not be another prophet after him. He who claims to be a prophet after him is a liar and a charlatan. This creed of finality of prophethood has been emphasized with great detail in hadith. And there's a beautiful hadith that we're going to just look at, narrated by Jabir bin Abdullah Razila Talanho, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, my example and the example of other prophets is that of a man who has built a house completely and excellently, except for a place of one brick. When the people entered the house, they wondered at its beauty and said, but for the place of this brick, how splendid the house will be. So I am that brick last end of all prophets. Sahih Bukhari, 3534. Let's go on to ayat number 41. Oh, you who believe, remember Allah with much remembrance. So if we claim to be believers, we must remember Allah much. Ayat number 42. And glorify him in the morning and in the evening. May Allah rem remind us, may, may Allah, may we remember, we, let's pray to Allah that may we, may we always remember our daily askar and the glory of Allah and that we remember him during our daily affairs every single day. Hide number 43, he is the one who sends his blessings upon you and his angels so that he may bring you out of darkness to light and he is the merciful to the believers he is the one who sends his blessings upon you and his angels this is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending mess blessings to rasul kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the angels sending blessings to rasul kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam and and we are supposed to send blessings to rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam that we that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may take us from darkness to light and he is merciful to the believers. Ayat number 44, their greetings on the day they will meet him will be peace and he has prepared a noble reward for them. Ayat number 45, O Prophet, indeed we have sent you as a witness and a bearer of glad tidings and as a warner and as one who invites to Allah by his permission and as a, an illuminating lamp. These, these are the beautiful, beautiful ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Rasul Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tafsir Asanul Bayan, volume four. 
The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam dispels the gloom of disbelief just as a lamp dispels the darkness of night. He is the beacon of light till the day of resurrection. Anyone can, if he wills, seek guidance from it and illuminate his heart and mind. Shining light, Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his life, Siraj and Munira. What a beautiful way to describe Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Only Allah can do that. Ayat number 47, and give glad tidings to the believers that they will have from Allah a great bounty and do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites and disregard their harm and put your trust in Allah and sufficient is Allah as a trustee. Waqafa billahi wakila. 49, O you who believe when you marry believing women and then divorce them before you have touched them, then there is not for you any waiting period to count concerning them. So provide for them and release them with good release. These are instructions being given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in ayat number 50, O Prophet, indeed we have made lawful to you your wives to whom you have given their bridal money, that's mahar, and those whom you rightfully possess from what Allah has given to you and the daughters of the paternal uncles and the daughters of paternal aunts and the daughters of maternal uncles and the daughters of maternal aunts who immigrated with you and a believing woman if she gives herself to the prophet and the prophet wishes to marry her a privilege only for you excluding the other believers we certainly know what we have made obligatory upon them concerning their wives and those whom they rightfully possess and there should be no discomfort upon you and allah is oft forgiving most merciful so these are exceptional conditions uh for rasul kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam at number 51 you may defer the turn off whom you will of them, or you may take to yourself whom you will. And whoever you desire of those from whom you had temporarily set aside, then there is no blame upon you in returning to her. That is more suitable that they may be conf comforted and not aggrieved, and that they may be pleased with what you have given them all of them and Allah knows what is in the hearts and Allah is nor of and nor most forbearing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's two beautiful names Al Alim and Al Halim. Um, and so we see here this is yet another special privilege conferred to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by Allah for he was allowed to go to any of them as he wished or stop going to any of them. But um, some commentators say that though the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had the permission of Allah to skip the turn of any one of the wives at will, he did not exercise the right, but was always equitable with respect to the turns of the wives, except that of Sada, who had of her own will gifted her turn to Aisha Razila Taala and her. In his last days when he fell terminally ill he lived in the house of uh, Hazrat Aisha anha, only after he had obtained the consent of all his wives that the wives may be comforted alhamdulillah it refers to his equitable distribution of terms of wives he practiced all his life although he was not obliged to abide by it by virtue of special permission given by Allah this fair and equitable treatment by him of his wives kept them content. Ayat number 52, it is not lawful for you to marry women after this, nor to exchange them for other wives, even if their beauty pleases you, except those whom you rightfully possess, and Allah is the observer of all things. Ayat number 53, O you who believe, do not enter the houses of the Prophet except when permission is given to you for a meal without awaiting its preparation. But when you are invited, then enter, and when you have eaten, then disperse without seeking to remain for a conversation. Indeed, that was troubling the Prophet, and he is shy of dismissing you, but Allah is not shy of the truth. And when you ask them 
his wives for something than ask them from behind the screen that is purer for your hearts and their hearts. And it is not for you that you trouble the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, nor that you should ever marry his wives after him. Indeed, that is an enormity near Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking on the behalf of Rasul Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and telling everyone that you should respect Rasul Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You should not stay in his house too long. He needs time with his family. He needs time to rest. And uh, he cannot say that um, he's tired or anything else like that because he's too shy. But Allah is not shy, Allah says. And then... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the wives of Rasul Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our mothers, that you should speak from behind the screen. It is purer for you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, um, and it is not for you that you trouble the messenger of Allah, nor that you should ever marry his wives after him. Indeed, that is an enormity near Allah. So all the wives of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are our mothers. Ayat number 54, whether you reveal a thing or conceal it, indeed Allah is all nor of everything. There is no blame upon them concerning their fathers of their sons or their brothers or their brother's sons or their sister's sons or their women or whom they rightly possess and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is a witness over all things. Ayat number 56, indeed Allah and his angels send blessings on the prophet. O oh, you who believe, send blessings on him and greet him with worthy greetings. Alhamdulillah, we have been told to uh, send blessings to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And um, we're we are told here that Allah and his angels send blessings on the prophet. O oh, you who believe, send blessings on him and greet him with worthy greetings. In the Inna Allah malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayyu allazina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Indeed Allah and his angels send blessings on the Prophet O oh, you who believe send blessings on him and greet him with, a wor with worthy greetings Ayat number 57 Indeed those who annoy Allah and his messenger Allah has cursed them in the world and the hereafter and prepared for them a humiliating punishment and those who harm believing men and believing women for something other than what they have earned deserve then certainly they bear the guilt of false accusation and this is a manifest sin at number 59 O prophet tell to your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to draw over themselves their outer garments that is more suitable that they should be known and not harmed and Allah is oft forgiving most merciful so here in this ayat so, um, we are in surah ahzab ayat number 59 and we also saw in surah nur the quranic uh, you know a message to us of modesty that we are being told cover we should cover ourselves believing men believing women should cover themselves with loose clothing dress modestly walk modestly and so they won't be harmed and no one can guarantee not being harmed but they're more likely not to be harmed if one is covered properly we were told about khimar a covering that is on the head and that covers then should come over our chest and here we are being told to cover ourselves have an outer garment of course an outer garment is a loose garment nothing tight and so these are the rules and regulations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so that we are protected from wrong people inshallah ta'ala ayat number 60 if the hypocrites and those in whose heart is a disease and those who spread rumors in the city do not cease, we will let you overpower them. Then they will not remain your neighbors therein except for a little. At number 61, accursed wherever they are found, they are seized and massacred completely. So the uh, hypocrites used to circulate rumors in Medina to demoralize the uh, Muslims. For example, they would say the Muslims of such and such place have been subdued or the enemy is on its way to attack them with formidable force. It is, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying if they do not desist from raising false alarm and creating panic among the 
Muslims, they will be made to suffer an exemplary punishment. Some scholars say that it is a commandment. Anyhow, the hypocrites stopped raising false alarm after the revelation of this verse and were therefore saved from this punishment promised in this verse. This is recorded in Fatul Qadir. So we go on to the next ayat. Um, ayat number 62, such is the way of Allah with those who passed away before and you will never find any change in the way of Allah. Sunnatullah. Ayat number 63, people ask you about the hour. Say the knowledge is of, it, of it is only with Allah and what will make you know perhaps the hour is near. Indeed, Allah has cursed the disbelievers and prepared for them a blaze. Abiding therein forever, they will not find any protector or any helper. The day their faces will be turned into the fire, they will say, oh, we wish we had obeyed Allah and obeyed the messenger. And they will say, our Lord, indeed, we obeyed our chiefs and, uh, and the great men, and they misled us from the right way. Ayat number 68, our Lord, give them double punishment and curse them with a great curse. Ayat number 69, O you who, be, who believe, do not be like those who abused Musa. Then Allah cleared him of what they said, and he was honorable in the sight of Allah. O you who believe, fear Allah and speak the right word. He will amend for you your deeds and forgive your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has certainly attained a great attainment. Ayat number 72, indeed, we offered the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, but they refused to bear it and feared from bearing it, but man bore it. Indeed, he was unjust and ignorant. So the trust here refers to the obligatory duties imposed by the Sharia, duties which, if fulfilled, bring reward, and if ignored, bring punishment. When the earth the sky, the mountains were asked to bear the burden of these duties they feared and flinched from bearing it. When it was offered to man, he readily agreed to bear it. Seeing the immense reward promised for it, these obligatory duties have been compared to a trust, a hint that it is, an ob it is as obligatory for humans to carry them out as it is obligatory, obligatory to return something given in a trust. How did Allah offer the trust to the heaven and the earth and the mountains? What does it mean? How did they respond? When did man accept this trust? We do not know the answer to these questions. We cannot describe them. Allah has invested each of his created beings with a kind of sense of which he has no knowledge, but Allah, um, which we have no knowledge of. Oh, I will read that again. We cannot describe them. Allah has invested each of his created beings with a kind of sense of which we have no knowledge. But Allah is able to understand what they say. Allah must have surely offered to them to keep this trust, but they refused to do so. Their refusal was no disobedience on their part. They refused because they were afraid of the terrible consequences in case they would not fulfill the obligations thereof. A human is by his nature hasty and impetuous. He did not reflect much on the consequences, therefore, especially the punishment ensuing from the failure to fulfill the obligation, but in his desire for the reward, readily agreed to bear the burden. By bearing the burden, he wronged himself and by underestimating its consequences, proved that he was ignorant. This is, um, I'm reading this from Tafsir Ahsan al-Bayan. So basically, uh, Allah g g gave us this trust, this sharia, and uh, if we follow it, alhamdulillah, we'll be rewarded. We will go forward so that Allah may punish the hypocrite men and hypocrite women and the men and the women who associate others with him. And Allah will return in mercy to the believing men and the believing women, and Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, we have gone through Surah Ahzab, the Confederates, Surah number 33 in Jews 22. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me for my shortcomings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us towards learning this surah in a more better way, in an in-depth way, understanding its gems, its lessons. Alhamdulillah, a beautiful surah about uh, Rasul Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, some glimpses of uh, Rasul Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's lives and our mothers, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's wives and alhamdulillah the battle of Ahzab and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped the believers. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless everyone, guide everyone, protect everyone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the opportunity to ask for forgiveness. Inshallah ta'ala may Allah bless you all. Ameen. Inshallah we will continue tomorrow. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.